I'm just an old timer who gravitates to the big rivalries, the tradition rich games. USC, UCLA, this is just paramount for me to watch each and every year. It's a beautiful setting, especially, of course, at the Rose Bowl. We got Tony Syracuse on the line from Last Word on College Football to talk USC, UCLA, or my apologies to the Bruins fans, UCLA, USC. <laughs> Tony, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mark. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Before we break these two teams down on the field, yeah. you've got some uh, off-the-field news that could really impact the ability to win games down the line. Yeah, sure. UCLA announced today that they have a new apparel deal with uh, Michael Jordan and the Jumpman brand from Nike. Uh, it's a six-year deal that starts at the end of the academic year, so it would be July 1st. Uh, when the deal starts, the money was not announced. Um, it's, it, you know, look, it's interesting. UCLA for a while had the richest deal with Under Armour and, um, you know, Under Armour wanted out. UCLA wasn't performing and they wanted out with some other schools. And in the, in the court discovery, they realized that Under Armour is actually under great financial duress, which was a large part of them wanting out of some of the college deals. They now have multiple schools suing them. Um, but, you know, look, Martin Jarman, the new athletic director, came in. He said he'd been working on this really early on and consulted with some of UCLA's uh, recent great basketball players like Kevin Love and Russell Westbrook to talk about the branding because, of course, uh, Jumpman first came about the scene as a basketball entity. Uh, now they, uh, they outfit several football programs also. UCLA, by my count, is the sixth school in the country to take on the Jumpman product. Um, they do football and basketball apparel, so the other teams at UCLA will be outfitted with Nike. Um, UCLA made the announcement via a very flashy uh, video on social media with Russell Westbrook narrating part of it, talking about the legacy of UCLA. And uh, then it goes up the, the steep steps on campus where you hear Martin Jarman talking about, it's time to take the next step. And it shows him in a suit and under the suit, you can see the t-shirt with the Jumpman logo. And uh, it, it, frankly, it was pretty well done. It was something you never, like you wouldn't have seen this kind of innovation and creative thinking from Dan Guerrero ever. He likely would have crawled back to Adidas and asked for forgiveness for ever leaving. And you know, you, you would have had that. But now on rivalry week against USC, which is a longstanding Nike client, UCLA makes this announcement. The timing, I am certain, was not a coincidence. We've got a little juice in the ball game coming up this weekend yeah. as well from both sides. Uh, it's yeah. it's been difficult to get both schools, both teams, on a plane where okay, you've got reason to be optimistic and be excited right. about both sides. Right. Uh, that has been fairly rare over the last uh, couple decades. Looking at uh, your Bruins uh, with a 25 to 18 win over Arizona State, mm -hmm. it's back to back wins. It's three and two, first time since 2017. And I don't want to be one of those people, 2017, well, that just means two times that it hasn't happened, but it does seem significant because it is the first time during the Chip Kelly era to be over 500 at this point in the season. And uh, so, what do you take away from the, the Arizona State effort uh, in regards to the uh, positive vein? Yeah, look, I think it was not an easy game for UCLA to win because uh, Jane Daniels, the Arizona State quarterback, presents the kind of game that gives the UCLA defense problems. And that is the, um, the, the speed to the edge, the speed to the corner. Arizona presented the same problem the week before. And, um, you know, USC is not that kind of offense. So this is going to be different. It's interesting. This is, as you pointed out, the history of the rivalry. This is the 90th edition of this game now. They took a few years off during World War II. Um, for anyone keeping count at home, this is the 45th edition for me at this game. Uh, so this is, uh, I've got my own longstanding rivalry tradition here. You know, USC is 50, 32 and seven back when they still had ties in college football, um, over this time. And, um, but look, with regards to this game, Keaton Slovis ate UCLA alive last year, threw for over 500 yards, four touchdowns. The defense had absolutely no answers for him. And Slovis is just as good this year. 
in the limited time we've seen him, in the limited time we've seen any college football quarterback this year, uh, he's still throwing at a 72% completion rate, and he's got 10 touchdowns and two interceptions. The difference this year, a few things. One, we talked about the lack of edge speed that USC has. Frankly, they don't have a running game at all. You look at the Washington State game from Sunday night, you take into account the, the sacks, you subtract that as the NCAA does in team rushing yardage, and USC had a net five yards rushing against Washington State. Um, so, you know, look, Vivey Malapai is their leading rusher. He's got 145 yards on the season, all right? UCLA's Demetric Felton gets that per game, you know, pretty much. And then you add in Britton Brown, and UCLA's got, you know, a pretty decent running game. But we talked to Chip Kelly yesterday about the difference between this year and last year, and the biggest thing is the defense. You and I have talked about this repeatedly Jerry Azanero's defense was among the worst in the country the last two years. Um, and this year, it's top 50. So it is a dramatic improvement. And we asked Chip about what the improvements were, and he said it's a more athletically gifted defense. You know, they added guys that we've talked about, o, uh, uh, Eno Obi and uh, Q Knight, Quantrez Knight. Uh, they also have... Uh, some guys that are healthy, you know, who weren't healthy last year. And so it's a it's a very different defense. Um, and so, you know, they've got, um, you know, they've got a lot more health. They've got a lot more speed. They're a lot more aggressive as a result. You see the, the number of sacks on the team going up dramatically. Uh, and it was funny. We talked to one of the players yesterday. We talked to Quentin Lake. And we asked him what the difference was going to be. And he jokingly sort of jokingly said me because I was on the sidelines last year and I'm not saying I make all the difference but it does make a difference in the defense he is aggressive he can play in the nickel he is a four down guy on defense and um, he said I, I'm ready to go so it, it it on paper it looks like it's a more even matchup than it was last year Lake had six tackles against the Sun Devils. Caleb Johnson and uh, Mo Osling each had uh, two sacks in that game against uh, Jaden Daniels and company as uh, UCLA again wins uh, to move their record to three and two. So maybe Chip Kelly's maybe finally I, I had kind of written it off. I thought it was a near perfect hire out of the gate. Then, of course, the, the first two seasons couldn't have been much worse and they get off to the bad start this year. Uh, but I, I know it's only a small sample size, but is there reason to reasonably believe that they've turned a corner? It looks like it, but I'm going to wait for the this game and whatever game they wind up playing on championship weekend. I'm going to wait a little bit longer because there have been times, there have been individual games, individual performances where I've said, okay, this is – the Dorian Thompson Robinson we've been looking for. This is the UCLA team we've been looking for. This is the offense we've been looking for. And they haven't been able to sustain it. You know, as you pointed out earlier on, they're three and two for the first time since October 21st of 2017. Doesn't sound like a, that long of a time, except that Jim Mora was the coach then. And then they went on a losing streak and, and Mora got fired. And the Chip Kelly era coming into the season had a grand total of seven wins over two seasons. And look, I was of the belief that during the COVID era, very few coaches were going to get fired. There was going to be some wiggle room. And that has turned out to not be true. Several are getting shown the door before the season is over. I believed that Kelly's job was safe for those and other reasons. But then when they started off slowly, they looked horrible against Colorado in week one. I was like, wow, maybe not. Maybe his job isn't safe. If he wins, if he wins out, if he gets a winning record, then obviously his job is safe. Look, we joke with Kelly because he always talks about the process. He once denied to me in a post-game interview that he ever used that phrase. It was just two years ago after the Washington game. And I was sitting there looking at him thinking, I got all these audio files in my laptop with you saying it. 
but I just, you know, like any reporter would, you let it go. Um, but he does. He talks about the process and he and the players talk about the process. This process has taken longer than any UCLA fan would ever be OK with. But maybe, maybe with a win Saturday, they are where they're supposed to be in the process. There's still a lot of question marks. All right. And Dorian Thompson Robinson still has problems taking care of the ball. They had four turnovers against Colorado and they lost. They had with Chase Griffin at quarterback, they had four turnovers against Oregon and they lost. In their three wins, they have a grand total of one turnover. That is all about taking care of the ball. And, you know, Chip recites statistics to us. You know, if you are plus one on turnovers, you have, you know, a 92% chance of winning. And if you're, you know, minus three, you have a 60%, whatever the numbers are. He actually cites statistics in some of these press gaggles about turnovers. They have been clean in their three games. They have been immensely clean. DTR has a turnover problem. He he makes plays he should not make. He tries to extend plays he should not try to extend. He had a completely bizarre penalty in the end zone last week when he was throwing it away and was only three steps away from being outside the tackle box and the play being legal, but he stood there. Um, it was He has those moments. As much as he has some some great flashes of offense and can take off and tuck and run and do all those things, he still has those lapses, which, which make it a little bit of a high wire act. I mean, you know, look, he's only completing about 55% of his passes right now. And um, you're going up again. You are going to have to outscore USC. You just are. Slovis is, has got a great arm. If he's allowed to sit back in the pocket – even even Chip said yesterday he will eat you alive if you let him sit back in the pocket. He's got fantastic receivers, Amon Ross St. Brown and Tyler Vaughns and Drake Jackson. He's got great receivers, great talent. They are not a particularly fast team, so the key will be getting him out of his comfort zone. They are UCLA is going to have to be aggressive, push through the line, get a pass rush on him. The challenge being that leaves you mostly in one-on-one -on -one coverage against that very talented group of receivers. Tony Syracuse joining us from Last Word on College Football, USC, UCLA, coming up this weekend. And uh, we would ask that you subscribe, hit that bell for the notifications. That way you know when we're going live. And, of course, uh, hit the like button, leave your comments below. As a Pac-12 guy, Tony, did you write off any thought of a college football playoff from day one? Or now that USC's gotten into a position where certainly the first two efforts against Arizona State and Arizona were not impressive. They were wins. They pulled them out. They won the games. But not playing particularly great teams, especially in the Wildcats case. But the last two weeks, the, the Utah game was pretty impressive. They controlled that game, gave up little on defense, 33-17. Then this past week, they just bludgeoned uh, F Washington State out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Bam, it's 35 nothing before you blink. And uh, they coast home with a win. That certainly other things would need to happen. And I've gone through the, the chain of what would need to happen, so I won't do it uh, here again. But there there is a there is a way, there is a path to get them into the discussion. And it's not crazy to get them as a 6-0 and mm -hmm. Pac-12 champion uh, into the playoff conversation. Do you think that's just crazy talk? or It's not crazy talk. Look, to answer your first question, when the season started, I thought Oregon, USC, outside, outside chance because – um, I never believed that the Pac-12 would get through all their games, not when you had no bye weeks to be able to reschedule or postpone. It was play or cancel. Then, of course, Oregon showed themselves to be incredibly average, incredibly overrated. Um, and so that left it to USC. I, I think it's still an outside stretch. I think the irony, of course, is you're looking at Colorado with their best with their best team in years. But because the USC game was canceled, 
uh, because of, of USC's COVID, Colorado is is going to be sitting behind USC the entire rest of the way. And you know, Colorado gets you know gets through it undefeated. They're not going to the playoffs. USC is the lone shot. And as we've been saying all along, it depends on what happens with the other conferences. The Pac-12 needs help uh, from other conferences. They need some implosion from the other conferences in order to get in there. Look, you're you're, you're looking at Notre Dame and Clemson playing at least one, you know, one more game against each other, but, you know, certainly for the conference championship. So someone's coming out of there with a loss. You're looking at the possibility of two SEC teams because, you know, depending upon what happens in the SEC championship game, but if Florida keeps it close, certainly they're deserving of a spot. Uh, You know, Alabama is the dominant team right now. And now with the cancellation of one of the other great rivalries in college football, Ohio State, Michigan, um, you know, you're looking at, you know, the Big Ten is going to need to change the rules that they put out in order to get Ohio State into the conference championship game. So there are all of these things all happening at one time. USC, best they can do is go out, play the game, win convincingly Saturday, go to the conference championship game, win convincingly, because they're going to need some style points with the seven games. And they're gonna they're gonna need to hope that you know somehow the Big Ten betrays its own best interests and doesn't give Ohio State that waiver. Um, they need some help to get in, but if they run the table, I, I think they deserve a legitimate look. I will uh, leave the Big Ten's misgivings. Uh, <laughs> I'll let that go right now. I've ranted on them, but sure. we're sticking with the Pac-12, of course. Here, sure. I've got two issues with this situation in the Pac-12 South. Issue Mm -hmm. number one is that there's a tiebreaker system to decide and determine who should win the division championship. Well, in most years, you only need a tiebreaker for a three-way tie because a two-way tie is decided by the head-to-head and everybody Mm -hmm. plays in the division. So that game was, of course, uh, canceled because of COVID regulations. So I, I get that and I fully support whatever the regulations were that canceled the game. I don't have the issue with that. What I have an issue with is the tiebreaker system. So I'm going through these uh, last week and I see where both teams are undefeated. Okay. So pretty much you don't need to go through the tiebreaker system because every scenario results in a tie because mm-hmm. both teams are undefeated. Mm -hmm. Uh, except Colorado did play the one less conference game, having played uh, San Diego state to make up for a game. So however you look at three and O versus four and O but basically they're, they're tied down the list, unless you would go to a point differential, but what the PAC 12 has done and not picking on the PAC 12, because this is the same stipulation in other conferences. I don't know if every conference has this one, but for the college football ranking to determine who right. should win a conference or a division to get to a conference championship game, I just think is utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. It's, it's absurd. And what it, what it tells you is that when the Pac-12 decided to come back and they, and they drew out this list of what's going to happen, they never saw it getting that far down of the potential items of what you're going to need to have a tie break. Um, you know, I don't think anyone saw it coming. So they threw up their hands and said, you know, look, we need two more things on the box, you know, on the list to check the box. Eh, let's let, let's throw in the rankings because we're never going to get that far down anyway. And now you really pretty much are. And it is, you know, look, it's absurd. It's more mismanagement by the Pac-12, you know, offices and Larry Scott. Um from people who never thought they were going to be here. They never thought they were going to play anyway. They much less create the kind of schedule that they did with no bye weeks, um, no open weeks in order to move things. So it was, it was almost a throwaway to do that. And now it's going to come back to bite them in the rear end. And, you know, frankly, they deserve it. And so the other thing that I find amusing about all that tiebreaker system, and I didn't look this up myself, but I had a a few other sources verify that's what they were looking at, is that below the college football ranking is a coin toss. Yes. Well, knowing that the college football ranking is never a tie, you don't even need to put in the coin toss because we'll never hit the coin toss. 
Right. You probably should have put the coin toss in ahead of the college football ranking. I think as, it's just as the next line breaker. You know, it yeah, it is. It's it's you know, to, toss a silver dollar up in the air and decide who represents you in the biggest payday that that college football gets every year. I mean, it's 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 absurd, but it's the Pac-12. What do you want? And so I'm just going to pile on with one more point concerning yeah. all this mess because there was an opportunity last week to switch games mm -hmm. and have Colorado and USC meet on the field mm -hmm. and just flip flop their games and just let mm -hmm. them play. Mm -hmm. So the conference has been more flexible than the other conferences in doing this right. for its teams. Why didn't they set up the game that's going to decide the division? And, and it didn't even... It had it impacted Arizona or Washington State, I would have said, okay, I can understand the integrity of not disrupting their division schedule. But they were both you were just you were just supplanting their non-division game anyway. So Arizona's plays Washington State, fine. Right. Why didn't it happen? Yes. All right. Let me put on let me put on my Oliver Stone conspiracy theory hat here. It was to protect USC. It it it, it was Look, you've got a you've got a blue blood program, which because I got to tell you, going back to the beginning when they reset the schedules, there was a part of me that looked at it and said they're greasing the tables for Oregon and USC to meet in the conference championship game. You look at UCLA and going off not where UCLA is now, but where they had been for two years. UCLA in the original schedule was not scheduled to face Oregon. When they went to the conference only revised schedule, UCLA was not scheduled to face Oregon. All of a sudden, after they stop and then start again, UCLA has got to go up to Eugene and play. And you're like, where did that come from? Who did Chip Kelly, you know, irritate at the conference office? How did that happen? And it was to grease the skids a little bit for Oregon based on where UCLA's performance had been the last two years. Turns out it didn't really matter because Oregon isn't all that right now. They don't have the talent right now, especially on offense. Um, but there's a little bit of you got to protect the blue bloods because you look at what you're going to get out of the SEC. You look at what you're going to get out of, you know, potentially the Big Ten or the Big 12, certainly the ACC with either Clemson or Notre Dame. They are blue blood programs. The Pac-12 does not want to see Colorado with a shot at the playoff. They just don't. The NCAA doesn't. The playoff committee doesn't. They don't want to see it. Is that fair to Colorado? Of course it's not. Carl Durrell has done a fabulous coaching job this year. Um, but the conference doesn't want to see it. And so, you know, there's a little bit of conspiracy theory that goes with, you know, we're, we're going to massage the schedules a little bit. We're going to manage things as they go on. Because as you pointed out, they made last minute changes Throughout the season, throughout the last two months, you know, UCLA lost the Utah game and within four hours was playing Cal, you know, scheduled you know, later on. Um, Stanford has is, is living in, you know, the state of Washington right now because the Bay Area health directors have banned all participation, all sports participation completely. And since they had to go play Washington, Washington State, they just stayed up there for two weeks. Changes have been made on not even a weekly basis, a daily basis within the conference. I don't think the conference felt very motivated to do this. Tony Syracuse, the last word on college football, always providing a ton of insight into UCLA, the Pac-12 and the nation right here. So, um, Take the deep dive, head on over to Last Word on College Football. We got Tony, we got Kevin McGuffey, Jason Ray, those guys just I gotta, uh, I gotta say a word about Kevin for. McGuffey. I gotta say a word about K Mac because look, not only is the guy the best around in coverage of the University of Kentucky, but the guy handles our weekly bowl projections every week for the God last month. Him. Exactly. You want to talk <laughs> about a guy who deserves combat pay. Because staying on time, you know, as soon as it's published, yes, yesterday, as soon as it was published, the lo first ever Los Angeles Bowl was canceled. You know, he's he's staying on top of this stuff, not even daily, but hour by hour. I got to, you know, K-Mac is one of our great writers, but man, I got to give it up to the guy and what he's been able to pull off with the weekly bowl projections. Well, on Saturday, we have the true Los Angeles Bowl, USD, yes. UCLA. There we yep. go. Yep. All right, Tony. Appreciate Mark it. Always glad to do it, Mark.